indeed a great honor and pleasure to be here today at uh, the Asia Growth Research Institute. It's my first visit here and uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. And uh, ladies and gentlemen here and on the screens, uh, it's also my great pleasure to share some ideas and views about the interest and role of the European Union in East Asia. Uh, in my experience, not that much is known about the European Union, although the EU is certainly an important player in international relations, but a lot has to do with the what we call in political science, the activeness of the European Union. So what is the European Union? Um, so, of course, it's the EU institutions in Brussels, but it's also the member states. But today I will talk mainly about what we collectively refer to as Brussels. So the, the institutions of the European Union and so what the EU does collectively in its relations with uh, East Asia. I will uh, say a little bit more about the difficulties in, in defining the activeness a bit later and also the, the challenges um, that uh, are posed by the fact that um, foreign and security policy is still a domain of the member states. It's not an integrated policy area of the European Union. So, of course, the European Union acts on behalf of the member states, but, but when it comes to um, foreign policy, that is still the sovereign domain uh, eventually of the member states. But before I start, before I go into the details of uh, the EU's relations with East Asia, I would first like to say a, a few um, brief words about Rostock, the city of Rostock and the University of Rostock, where I'm based. So as Professor Dai already said, Rostock is in the northeastern part of Germany on the coast of the Baltic Sea. It's an old uh, city, a um, bit more than 800 years old, uh, a maritime city. So trade has always played a very important part for Rostock. And uh, so also at our university, we have a very strong international orientation. Um, so in my field, political science, we have a strong focus on Asian studies and also on Latin American studies. Um, and uh, the university, so you see the main building of the university here, is uh, one of the oldest universities in Europe. It's actually the third oldest in Germany. It's 604 years old. So yeah, that's so to give you um, yeah, a small idea about how the city and the university looks like. But now back to the topic of today's presentation, the EU in East Asia. So this is what I'm planning to do. Um, first of all, what is the starting point of all that? Why is it important? Why is it interesting to reflect on the EU's interests and role in East Asia? Then secondly, I will say something about how the normative approach of the EU towards its external relations has changed. So because we have seen some important changes in the EU's outlook, and foreign relations, international relations since about 2021. And then what are the EU objectives in East Asia? What does the EU tries to achieve here? What are the main interests really? And then I will present you four findings on the status quo of the relations and also elaborate briefly on four challenges. So what are the achievements to date and what are the problems maybe uh, in relation to uh, the EU's international position in general and also uh, in particular with regards to its relations with East Asia. And then as a quick summary at the end, light and shadow of the EU's geopolitical ambitions. So setting the stage. As I said, 
there have been some developments since 2021. Um, in terms of its strategies, the EU always used to have a rather modest approach when it came to its ambitions in international relations. But now the EU has become more assertive, has become in a way more outspoken about what it wants to achieve in the world. And there is a EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region, of which East Asia is of course a part of 2021. And it clearly outlines the EU's ambition to increase the EU's engagement, build partnerships. And you find this now everywhere, really the main obje objective of the EU's international relations to reinforce the rules-based international order. And the EU also wants to address global challenges, not just in Europe itself, but on the global stage. And this has to be read in combination with the strategic compass for security and defense of 2022, which is another key strategy of the European Union. Again, we have here the strong reference to uh, the EU's desire to promote an open and rules-based regional security architecture, including securing the maritime routes and also to enhance a naval presence in the Indo-Pacific, which is not easy to achieve because, I mean, the EU, and this is something I'm going to elaborate on a bit later, doesn't have its own armed forces and doesn't have its own navy. But there is uh, increasing military cooperation within the European Union these days, which is, of course, also related to uh, the war in Ukraine. And then uh, here I have a quote from um, the, the European Parliament's um, view on the EU's role in East Asia. And according to the European Parliament, the EU is a strong economic player in East Asia and is working to foster fair trade, multilateralism, institution building, democracy, good governance, and human rights. So you have a first reference to the um, norms and values that drive the EU's international relations generally, not just in East Asia, but certainly also very prominently these days in East Asia. Uh, so I would like to say a few words about this evolution of the EU's interest-driven approach to external relations, because it hasn't been there until recently. So. When you, for example, look, I have to maybe say a few words about how the European Union conducts its international relations. It is based on several instruments, as they, as they call it. So until 2021, the EU had instruments for its uh, cooperation with developing nations um, and its relations with uh, industrialized nations and also geographical approaches um, a strategic approach to its immediate neighborhood, so the neighboring country of the European Union, and then there were strategies for different regions in the world. Um, and according to one of the most important instruments, the Development Cooperation Instrument, uh, which was valid from 2014 to 2020, as you see here a quote from this, relations between the Union and the member states on the one hand and partner countries on the other hand shall be based on and shall promote the shared values of human rights, democracy, the rule of law, as well as the principles of ownership and mutual accountability. I mean, this. Um, strong focus on norms and values uh, has always been there, basically. But now when you compare it to the new uh, strategic approach, now the EU has only one instrument, which is called the Neighborhood Development and in International Cooperation Instrument, uh, which is called Global Europe, which applies to the EU's relations with the entire world. So there is no difference anymore if the EU deals with developing countries or industrialized nations. So there is one big strategic and financial framework um, for relations with all states and all regions in the world. And here you see how this values and norms-based approach of the EU has evolved. Now there is a very strong focus on the 
European Union's own interests. So you can see that here, that the EU should, the, um, that um, the instrument should support so the Union's fundamental interests, principles and values in all the aspects. But in here again, we have promoting democracy, the rule of law, respect for human rights, sustainable development, fight against climate change, addressing irregular migration and forced displacement, and so on and so on. So we have a long list of objectives, something the EU wants to achieve in its external relations. So this is much clearer than before. Before, remember, the EU talked about shared values. Now it's about the core EU interest that the EU wants to promote in the world. And here are the specific objectives in East Asia. For When you compare it again, um, the regional strategy from 2014 to 2020, here it, it said the EU-Asia relations are expanding and the EU is seeking an increasingly close relationship with Asia. Now, when you look at the new strategy from 2021 to 2027, now, and this is important, look at this, the EU aims to reinforce the legitimacy of the EU in the Asia Pacific as a value-based global actor and a standard setter across the whole spectrum of EU policies. So in a way, the EU aspires to have a significant impact on norms and values which are internationally, globally valid in East Asia. So it, it is here you can see that the interest of the EU clearly goes beyond economic interest, goes beyond trade interest, goes, goes beyond investment interest. It's really at the core about key norms and values. So of course, this begs the question, uh, how successful can the EU be and how successful has the EU already been in terms of promoting this norms and values based approach? So has anyone noticed? Is uh, there any success? Is there any effectiveness in promoting these ideas and these values and the norms? So this is this is something I hope uh, to address and I hope to answer in the next few minutes. So but not, let us first look at the EU's uh, relations with the countries of um, East Asia. So let us start with Japan very briefly because there is a lot to be said about the EU's relations with Japan because Japan is probably now the most important partner of the EU in East Asia. The EU and Japan have been strategic partners since 2000, 2003. So of course, I mean, there is no difference in terms of uh, outlook, in terms of the basis of the approach to international relations. So both the EU and Japan share fundamental values, human rights, democracy, rule of your law, and um, quote from the EU strategy, strong commitment to sustainable development, multilateralism, and a rules-based WTO system. So in many ways, in terms of promoting the rules-based and strengthening the rules-based international system, Japan is really the EU's key partner in the region. Um, we also have South Korea, of course, as an important partner. It was also the first Asian country that signed a free trade agreement with the EU in 2014. Uh, and lots of um, agreements have followed since then, key uh, um, agreements since the EU-South Korea crisis management framework. Uh, it's called, I mean, the full title is EU-South Korea crisis management framework uh, participation agreement. Uh, this allows South Korea to take part in EU crisis management operations of a civilian and military character. So this also applies to Japan. With both Japan and South Korea, the EU has actually um, increased its security-related cooperation. So for the EU, Japan and South Korea are not just economic partners. They are also partners in terms of stabilizing the international security order. And then we have China. 
So until a few years ago, China was also considered a partner of the European Union. That is no longer the case. So in the official EU speak, um, the China, uh, the EU follows a multifaceted approach towards towards China. So China is seen and described as a partner, competitor, but very important, also a systemic rival. So, and this is actually now uh, come to the fore. I mean, when we read about, when we hear about EU-China relations, the first reference is usually to the um, perception of China as a systemic rival. And in its strategy papers, in its official policy documents, the EU uses very strong language. Um, so, for example, the EU leaders agree on the need to engage with China when it is in the EU's interests, but only then, while at the same time seeking to reduce strategic dependencies. Um, and so the official terminology here is that the EU follows a strategy of de-risking. Uh, doesn't want to, of course, burn all its bridges with China, but there is a very critical approach towards China these days. And we will see a bit later what implications this strategic outlook has for the conduct of uh, the EU's relations with East Asia. Then, of course, we have North Korea. Um, there is not much going on, as you would imagine. Um, officially, it's called a policy of critical engagement, which combines pressure, mainly sanctions, with open communication channels, but there are no bilateral political or commercial treaties. But again, the key message here is that um, the EU wants to uh, keep the door open for discussions with North Korea whenever the opportunity arises, but does not have the ambition at the moment to really engage North Korea. And then finally, Taiwan, of course, here, as um, you would have guessed, the EU is committed to the one China policy, uh, referring to Taiwan, obviously not as an individual sovereign state, but as a separate customs territory. That's the official language used, not a sovereign state. But Taiwan is recognized as an economic and commercial entity. Right? So this is as far as the EU can go. Uh, and it also the EU also supports Taiwan's participation in multilateral forums. So the first finding, um, despite all the new strategies and the EU's ambitions to set and shape the norms and values in international relations and contribute to a stable rules-based international order. First and foremost, the EU is still an economic actor in East Asia. And um, on my many trips to Asian countries over the years, I've always noticed no matter what the EU tries in terms of strengthening its security profile, for example, in the region, the EU is always primarily perceived as an economic actor. And this is a very important economic actor, of course, for China. Um, China is the EU's largest trading partner in Asia. You have the figures here on, on the slide. So uh, if you break it down to um, the trade volume every day, it means that every day the trade volume is 1.9 billion euros every day of the year in economic relations and trade relations with between the EU and China. Japan is the EU's second largest trading partner with a total trade of uh, 141 billion in uh, euros in 2022. And of course, uh, the EU and Japan have a very comprehensive economic partnership agreement, which uh, came into force in 2019. It is the most important bilateral trade agreement of the EU overall. Uh, it covers nearly one third of global GDP, almost 40% of world trade and over 600 million people. And it has been very effective. Uh, trade in goods as the result 
of the EPA has increased by 20% and agri-food agri trade has increased by 34%. So the EPA has really paid off for both the EU and Japan. And it is so important because it goes beyond commitments on trade in goods and services. It's also a framework for bilateral investment and uh, it includes for the first time a specific commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, there are also ambitious targets for sustainable development. So, I mean, the EPA clearly shows that the EU and Japan support and promote really the same set of values and norms and ideas in international relations. So there is a very, very strong focus, of course, on sustainable development, um, on achieving the Paris climate goals and so on. So now as the third example, the third important, most important trade relations would then be EU-South Korea trade relations. But here some obstacles remain other than in the case of the EPA. So there are basically, as far as I know, uh, no conflicts or disputes in trade relations between the EU and Japan. But in the case of EU-South Korea, there are still some uh, unresolved issues. Finding two is on security considerations. And also very clearly to see that so beyond this very strong economic interests, um, security considerations have gained prominence. So the EU clearly wants to play a more security related role in East Asia. So for example, the very important EU-Japan strategic partnership agreement allows parties to take forward security cooperation. And so the idea is to jointly tackle ter terrorism and serious international crimes and prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And for example, Germany conducted joint military exercises with Japan in 2021. And there have also been um, cooperation on uh, maritime security between Japan and the EU. So as I said before, the EU wants to increase its naval presence. So there is the EU's naval force, which is a joint exercise and port calls off the coast of Somalia. And here uh, Japan has participated in 2014. There's also the digital partnership agreement, which is also um, kind of a landmark agreement between the EU and uh, Japan. So this has all um, very important security-related implications. So going beyond military security, right? It's it's also about uh, non-traditional security. It's about cyber security and all that. Um, and um, there's a, a clear move beyond the EU's traditional role as a civilian and soft power. Um, also in the case, not just uh, in the case of EU, Japan, but also in the case of um, South Korea, there have been several agreements uh, which have strengthened um, security related cooperation. Um, so again, in the case of Japan, it's a bit clearer what both parties want. In the case of South Korea, there are still some open questions. There's a lot of potential, which I think applies generally to the EU security related role in East Asia. But uh, not everything really that it would have would, would have be would have been possible has been tapped into. Yeah, I think there is a lot of room really to further develop security related cooperation. Finding three is on the EU as a geopolitical actor, and this is also very important. That is really the uh, a further new development in recent international relations. Now, because the EU wants to be seen as a geopolitical actor, which means nothing else than really uh, that the EU wants really to not, not just be a soft power, not just a power, not just an actor that promotes certain norms and values in international relations, but the EU wants to have a real impact when it comes to shape the international order. And you can only really do that if you have a lot of money at your disposal, because you cannot just stand there and say, oh, we want to be a geopolitical actor. We want to have geopolitical influence. You also need to have the means 
of achieving that. And this is a clear response, and there's no secret about that. This is not uh, an academic perspective where we try to interpret EU strategy building. This is something the EU says itself. So this is a clear, so the EU's geopolitical ambitions are a clear reaction to China's global role, and particularly the Belt and Road Initiative. So in the EU's perception, and what are the three points I have on the slide here is a summary of um, what the EU has to say about uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. And according to the EU's view, uh, China has promoted globalization with Chinese characteristics, such as non-transparent -tra contracting. And uh, again, according to the EU's perception, uh, China aims to become the world leader in high-tech industries and digital technologies, including artificial intelligence and 5G. And the concerns are tremendous in Europe these days about China's role in these areas. Um, and then third point, equally important, again, from the EU's perception and uh, um, EU's viewpoint, China has been systematically developing influence strategies using disinformation campaigns. So the EU wanted to respond to that. And the response is global gateway. So you have China's Belt and Road, and the EU answer is called global gateway. So there are 300 billion euros available until 2027. <laughs> to implement this strategy of global gateway. What does it mean? So you have the six pillars of global gateway here. So in essence, in a nutshell, it means that the EU also wants to fund and support big infrastructure projects, just the same way that China does, but in a much more transparent way, and also in a way that promotes the EU's norms and values that I referred to earlier on. So all this is related. So each and every individual project implemented on the Global Gateway makes a commitment to democratic values, is based on high standards, is based on the idea of good governance and transparency, it's also based on sustainability and environmental protection, and it's also supposed to catalyze private sector investment. So I have here a map of current global gateway projects in Asia. Um, and so without going too much into detail, I can tell you that most of these projects, multi-million projects, are really about environmental sustainability, climate protection, uh, this is one big area. The other big area is uh, digitalization, bridging the digital gap, helping countries to digitalize and uh, improving and strengthening their digital infrastructure. Because the idea is here for the EU to do it so, so that China doesn't have to do it. right? So there's a real competition with China here. But as you also can see here, there are no global gateway projects in East Asia, right? First of all, because uh, Japan and South Korea are industrialized rich nations, so they don't actually need the EU support. But then also because the EU shares, as I said, the same values with Japan and South Korea. Uh, so there is actually no need to, to promote certain norms here. So when you look at the map, you clearly see that these projects, these global gateway projects, are mainly based in countries where China has a strong influence. So this really means that the EU wants to counterbalance the Chinese influence here. Um, and so I should also note here that these project are, projects are not um, implemented just by the European Commission, so by the Brussels institutions, but also with the support of the EU member states. So this is called Team Europe. So the Team Europe approach was established during COVID when the EU, together with the member states, promoted and financed um, vaccinations and had many, many countries in the world. 
uh, to get their hands on uh, vaccinations and vaccines and, and strengthen their vaccination programs. And so they have kept this approach, which is called Team Europe, which is now, now, now applied to the whole area of EU cooperation. So the idea is to bring in, of course, funding and expertise also from the EU member states to make these global gateway projects really um, effective. And the uh, fourth finding here is um, that um, the EU has certain influence in international relations, um, I would say mainly due to its role as a soft power, because in a way the EU is attractive. The EU member states are attractive in the world. There are no serious problems. There are no serious ideological problems with um, European countries. Um, so some EU member states, particularly the Scandin uh, some of the Nordic countries like Finland or, or Sweden, are seen traditionally as, as neutral in international relations. They are often called upon when it comes to um, international negotiations and so on. So generally, I would say the image of the European Union is uh, positive. And this, of course, helps it to promote its ideas and to strengthen its relations in, um, the, uh, in the East Asian region. So, the, of course, you have studies on everything. You also have studies on the cultural attractiveness of states. And the EU's cultural attractiveness seems to be generally very strong across, across the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so in terms of its attractiveness, Europe ranks first in six countries, including Japan, and second in many others, including South Korea. But there are also challenges. Now I come to the four challenges. I've presented you the four findings, now the four challenges. And one is, well, that um, the EU collectively, the European Commission, um, and the EU member states do not necessarily always speak with one voice. Although they try very hard and although they are usually quite successful in that, it does not always happen the way that most governments, including the German government, including the French government, would like it to, uh, would like it to play out. So to just give you the example of um, the very, very difficult situation in Europe at the moment due to the war in Ukraine. So the EU has successfully managed to um, apply a strict sanctions regime on Russia. Uh, the EU has also, as you know, been very supportive in, um, in strengthening the Ukraine militarily. So by and large, the EU has uh, kept its, its position of speaking with one voice in this war. And this, of course, means to condemn Russia's actions no matter what uh, and take uh, sides with Ukraine and offer its full support to Ukraine. But then we have particularly Hungary and uh, the Prime Minister Orban, Viktor Orban, uh, who does not always like to follow the strict approach of, uh, well, the EU collectively, and has uh, recently embarked on uh, unannounced trips to Russia and also to China, which he called a kind of a peace mission, uh, contributing to um, a peaceful solution of the war. But uh, th this is not the way it has been perceived um, in the rest of the EU, because here, I mean, Orban and, and the Hungarian government have really tried to block uh, several of uh, the sanctions uh, that the EU has applied in its relay in uh, towards Russia, and now uh, Hungary at the moment has the presidency of the European Union. That uh, the way it works is that the presidency of the European Union rotates every six months. So at the moment it's Hungary's term, and uh, Orban really tries to uh, conduct its own foreign policy, which is not in line. Uh, with um, the rest of the EU. And this has caused uh, a lot of discomfort and also criticism in the EU. So um, the important point here is 
um, that, um, and this comes, uh, I, I mean, coming back here to my opening remark, uh, that it's not always easy to say who actually acts on behalf and in the name of the European Union. Um, so is it more the official representatives of the European Union in Brussels, um, like uh, recently re-elected um, president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and uh, the other two important persons uh, who will uh, resume uh, their duty or who, who will uh, take office in their new positions very soon, who also contribute to the conduct of the EU's foreign relations, Antonio Costa, uh, who will become the president of the European Council. So the European Council is uh, brings together the uh, heads of state and government of the EU member states. And then Kaya Kallas from Estonia, uh, who will be the high representative for foreign and security policy. So you could say she's the foreign minister of the EU, but it's called the high representative because, as I said before, um, foreign and security policy is not an integrated area uh, of the European Union. So the European Union uh, coordinates and it uh, also is, conducts relations with the rest of the world. But ultimately, eventually, it's the EU member states who also follow their own interests, their own strategies in um, their relations with the rest of the world. And, and so you have here the, uh, the French President Macron um, and Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor. And of course, these two are very, very important because basically nothing ever happens in the EU without the very prominent involvement of France and Germany. So whatever the French and German ideas are for Europe's international relations or the international relations of the EU uh, in particular, uh, so uh, you can uh, you can uh, you can be assured that the French and the German views really matter, right? And then, as I said before, you you have also sometimes heads of state and government who do not really want to play ball, who do not really want to follow also what they see maybe as um, the dominant role, preeminent role of France and Germany in the EU and try to uh, make their own arrangement uh, in foreign policy and international relations. So that makes it difficult because the whole system of, uh, of the EU's foreign policy and international relations is complex. Challenge two related to that are differences in the approach towards China. So there are no real problems when it comes to Japan because there is no disagreement about the necessity, the need, and also the importance of having very close relations with Japan. Same applies to South Korea. Uh, there's also a more or less unified view towards North Korea and towards Taiwan. But when it comes to China, there are different interests. There are EU member states who put the commercial interests to the fore, uh, who say, well, oh, OK, we are concerned about um, big projects like Belt and Road. We are concerned about China's growing influence in the world. We are also very concerned about uh, China's um, human rights record. Uh, but at the same time, China is crucial to us in economic terms, in trade terms, in investment terms. So trade relations are the most important ones. And then you have other EU member states who follow more uh, human rights approach first, who say, OK, we, we, we have to consider our economic interests, but we also have to be um, very strict and very honest um, about our norms and values driven foreign policy. Uh, we have to um, we have to really implement what we say in our strategy. So if our main emphasis is on democracy, human rights, uh, rule of law, good governance, then we also have to live by these standards. 
right? So otherwise, uh, we would have double standards. So they're very strict about that. So when you only compare the, the China, the respective China strategies of France and Germany, you notice um, that um, from the beginning, uh, France has been very clear about um, its interest to prevent the emergence of a new hegemon uh, and, to, and to establish a level playing field in Europe's relations with China, while Germany um, is more careful about this and more careful about the notion of countering China. And um, as I uh, said uh, just a few seconds ago, um, devotes more attention to the economic opportunities uh, offered generally by the Indo-Pacific region, uh, but uh, by uh, relations with China in particular. Uh, so the uh, third challenge then is that the EU is not a military actor. So the idea of a European army has been discussed actually since 1950. It was a French proposal uh, to establish a European army, uh, which then failed because the West German government had actually also already agreed to that, but then the government in France changed and the new government was no longer interested in it. Also then Germany uh, joined NATO and then uh, the establishment of a European army uh, was not uh, a priority anymore. But really since 1950, we have been regularly discussing the idea of a European army in Europe. And of course, this is now um, more important than ever um, in uh, view of uh, the, the current situation in Europe with the war in Ukraine, that there are more and more voices in Europe suggesting that we should put more emphasis on defending our interests and, of course, also defending the integrity of the European Union, the territory of the uh, European Union, if necessary, um, and, and not really rely uh, only uh, on NATO, particularly since we don't know what is going to happen in the United States after the next elections. There are very big concerns that uh, if Trump um, is re-elected, uh, as he already said, I mean, he would maybe reduce uh, the EU U.S.'s engagement in NATO. Uh, and uh, I don't really think and I can't see that, that the U.S. would withdraw from Europe. That is really, really hard to imagine, almost unthinkable. But it could well be um, that the dynamics of U.S. security relations within the context of NATO change. So this is also why during the first Trump presidency, Macron and uh, our chancellor at the time, Angela Merkel, uh, again brought up the idea of a European army. Again, but there is nothing really in the pipeline at the moment. So the current trend is towards more and um, well, deeper military cooperation among the EU member states, but uh, not a European army, which is, of course, also related to the fact that the security interest, where we have a, a, a broad area of shared security concerns and security interests, but then it's not really at this point that the EU member states would all be able to commit really to uh, one European army uh, under one command, right? So this would also create a lot of discussion. So who should lead, who should be in charge of such a European army? And the final, fourth and final challenge, the far right. Uh, and this is something that uh, concerns us a lot in Europe, but beyond Europe. We have this like a global trend in many countries in the world that the far right is gaining more and more uh, influence uh, and importance in politics. And of course, that means a threat to the liberal world order. So in a way, uh, the, the far right political parties across Europe, um, they challenge the EU's norms and values based approach. So there emphasis is not on the promotion of democracy and human rights. This is not in the interest of the far right. 
um, in a way, there are many representatives of far right parties across Europe who we could easily classify as anti-democrats, who openly flirt with the idea of stronger authoritarian leadership, and who in many cases have a lot of sympathy also, um, almost the way it seems, admire Putin, which is really hard to believe, but this is a sad reality. Um, so this means that uh, the more influence far-right parties uh, gain in Europe, that uh, this could seriously disrupt disrupt at some point uh, the EU's strategic approach uh, towards the rest of the world, its norms and values-based approach, um, and also its relations with East Asia. We are not there yet, fortunately. Um, but, well, as I said before, also the uh, recent uh, elections to the European Parliament have shown that uh, that the far right is gaining more and more influence. So finally, to conclude, light and shadow of the EU's ge geopolitical ambitions. So how realistic is this actually that the EU establish, establishes itself as an um, influential geopolitical actor um, in the world and in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific um, region? So, I mean... These three short findings here are based on an evaluation of the new uh, EU strategic approach. Uh, I was involved in that. Uh, so last year we conducted this major evaluation um, of this set of strategies that shape and define the EU's new global approach in its international relations. And so it was a big team, a large team that uh, contributed to this evaluation. So I uh, was actually in charge of the part that looked at the EU's relations with Asia and also Latin America. So I had a big area to cover. Um, so I had the opportunity to conduct a lot of interviews with EU officials and officials of other governments to capture their views on the effectiveness of the EU's new geopolitical approach and ambitions. So what we have found is really in a nutshell, I'm not going into the details, but yes, there is increased leverage. So the new strategic approach has helped the EU to gain more importance, to establish itself as a more influential actor in international relations. And what has certainly helped that the EU has only basically now one framework for its relations with the rest of the world. So also, uh, the major budget that goes into Global Gateway, that is a statement. So 300 billion euro, that is a lot of money. You cannot really make the world a better place with that kind of money, but you have really the opportunity to use this money strategically and use it well uh, to implement some key infrastructure-related projects, which promote certain European ideas and values. But there are partnership and coherence challenges. Uh, while the EU has improved coherence in its external relations and actions, there are ongoing challenges in reconciling its roles as a development actor, global player, and geopolitical actor. So this is a bit related to what I said before. So. Um, when I conducted interviews in several Asian countries, um, many of the officials from well, other governments, they were still uncertain about the EU's ambition. So what, the, what does the EU actually stand for? Um, and we always, at some point in the interviews, came back to the notion that at the end of the day, the EU was mainly an economic actor. Right, that its profile in international security relations and its ambitions to promote norms and values was visible, but not very strong at this point in time. Um, at the same time, one also has to be realistic about what the EU can achieve. Uh, the EU is not on par with the United States, with China, Right. Uh, this is, of course, related to the fact that the 
um, EU foreign policy making, the conduct of the EU relations is not homogenous. So you have different um, actors, you have different stakeholders involved. So it's not like a national government where you have a clear foreign policy interest, which is then implemented. Um, here, it's diverse. So and that makes it very, very difficult for the EU really to uh, act in a way that is on par with the big powers like the United States and China. So, but uh, to conclude in terms of uh, relations with East Asia, um, I see EU-Japan relations becoming even more important than they already have been. So I think there is a still um, potential for further, further deepening of relations, but we can also see that the EU and Japan have already been working together, uh, pursuing this joint interest in upholding and strengthening the rules-based international order in defending democracy and the liberal democratic order. So that is very important. Uh, so, so efforts uh, in relation to South Korea go in the same direction. Um, but uh, I think the EU is much further in this regard in its relations with um, uh, Japan. And with China, relations remain very difficult uh, due to the uh, diverging international outlook and the perception that the EU and China stand for opposite ideas of how the international order should look like. And there are, of course, also uh, tremendous concerns about the ongoing new alliance building the fact that Russia and China seem to be very close these days and making efforts towards um, increasing and strengthening relations and their partnership. And then we have uh, Iran entering the equation and so on and so on. So in a way, what the EU is does, does is also engage in this in a kind of alliance building, making sure to get as many like-minded uh, partners on board, uh, conclude as many agreements as possible to strengthen these partnerships for uh, in support and in defense of a global liberal rules-based order. And with that, I uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.